it, it's already uh, 5.01 and as usually we want to start on time or one minute late. So uh, let's get going. Um, welcome everybody. Welcome to another event. Um, I hope, I hope you have a more uh, optimistic week and the most more quiet weekend ahead uh, because of all this uh, first of May. I should have been in uh, on the seaside by now, but uh, you know these things, uh, this uh, this little virus coming along. So, uh, um, but I'm glad we're all together. We spend this time between friends. First of all, let me, like usual, um, share with you our partners as they've been along, along uh, with us all along. And we really appreciate a big thank to, to all, all of you, all of them uh, from Bucharest or from Cluj. Thank you for staying with us and uh, for believing in us. We believe in you and it's, uh, it's a great ride together. Uh, like usual, please turn the phones, the microphones off. Um, we're gonna turn them back on with questions. Our guests today um, agreed and they said that we can interrupt them at any time with questions. So uh, we can challenge them with, uh, with, with um, I don't know, ideas and, uh, and different uh, views or questions that we have to their stories. Um, we, um, I'm gonna have next event uh, with our uh, friend, Alina. She's been with us before in our forum uh, when she was telling us you know, how to see those signs uh, about the recession. And uh, we're gonna have a chance to listen to her right now on uh, Tuesday, the 5th. Um, today, you know those um, those places where uh, th those places where you you get in the plane and you always look left. You have to go right, but you always look left. And uh, there's the cockpit, and uh, we all, from small kids, uh, think, or at least I was thinking that I want to, you know, go left for once and uh, play around with all those buttons. I've been there a few times. Even though uh, on my 208, it's uh, kind of, uh, you know, tough. Um, but today, we're going to have a chance to actually get, go to the left. Um, we, we'll do that with, uh, with our guests, Octavian Pantish and uh, Captain Emil Dobrovolsky. Uh, Emil has been a pilot at Tarom for a while, uh, since 94. And he moved up through all the professional ranks from the small planes to the big planes. Uh, he also have a vast uh, experience in management. He uh, was serving as different operational and corporate leadership positions inside Tarom. Uh, went up to vice president and director of flight operations. And Octavian Pantish is one of the most popular Romanian business authors. Uh, he wrote Musai List in 2012, which is one of the best um, books on time management. On uh, It's a best-selling book in Romania on productivity and work-life balance. So if you didn't have the chance to take that book and read that book, please uh, pick it up. Um, he also uh, wrote four audiobooks on time management, practical leadership, change management and communication skills, and is co-author of the book Shift, published worldwide in uh, English. Um, we, but we'll talk about today about the cockpit. And uh, the cockpit, the, the cockpit hopefully is not uh, very dark, uh, but the book, Dark Cockpit, uh, wrote by, uh, written by both of them. It's an experience through a place that not, <clears throat> not a lot of us went. And um, it's full of uh, processes and uh, advices of, uh, uh, you know, those verified, verified information and, and processes that it's, uh, it's required in that uh, um, place, but also translated into the business. So if you have a chance, I highly recommend the book, 
please uh, pick it up. I would, I would take it. Okay. Um, so welcome today to uh, our guest, uh, Octavian and Emil. Please welcome, guys. Hello. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome. I'll, uh, Good evening. I'll leave it to you, Octavian, to start. Sure. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for making time to uh, uh, talk about flying in turbulent times. Um, let me start with the question, because my assumption is that for many of you, flying was and being in a plane was almost like a second home in the last years, not as much in the last month, but in the last years. So the question is this, were you ever in a flight and the captain was speaking and you could not understand a word of what he was saying? Did, did that happen to you? I think it did. Uh, yes, sometimes. especially in Africa. <laughs> <laughs> in Africa, but also in Europe and also in the US. And sometimes my, when I was sitting in, uh, in the airplane seat, I was thinking maybe they hold their nose like this. And because really there's no other explanation. I was, I'm joking now, but they say something like, welcome everybody, this is 5123 in London, weather outside. And you, you're there and you go like, what's going on? And why is he even bothering to talk if nobody can understand now um one way in which you can in you in which you know that you're flying with emil dobrovolsky is that you always understand what he's saying this was actually how we met um about 13 years ago i was on a, on, a, on a plane to uh, uh to rodos and uh, we were flying tarom hello good morning this is your captain and we could understand it was it was very good we met we stayed in touch ever since and i met him many times and uh, he had always interesting stories to, sh to share and we invited him to speak to some of our clients in their business events on topics like leadership and decision making and crisis management and i was fascinated to discover not only interesting stories but also many bridges that can be made with the business world so about one and a half years um, ago uh, I told him, hey, Emil, why don't you write a book, a how-to book? Because there's a lot of treasure of know-how in the aviation industry, in the cockpit, and it would be a pity not to, ha not to make that available to people in business and to students and to people in sports and to anybody who wants to become better and to achieve more. And uh, his, resp his response was, hey, Octavian, why don't we write it together? So this is how the uh, Dark Cockpit book came together. I'd just like to take two minutes to describe to you what the title is about. And then I'm going to give the, give the mic to, to Emil. Uh, we had different options for a title. But in the end, we stayed with Dark Cockpit because we said, hey, this has everything we're looking for in a title. It's, it's catchy in a way, it's intriguing in a way. We'll have to make a, a very clear subtitle, which we did to the book. Um, but here's what the dark cockpit means. Dark cockpit is an aviation concept. It's an aviation term for the situation when you're flying and everything is running smoothly. As you know, in cockpit, when you looked left, as <laughs> Virgil was saying earlier, there's plenty of buttons, there's hundreds of them in screens, and there's lights all over the place. And uh, each light means something. For instance, you can have a white light, which means that something is off. It could be a pump, it could be a generator that is not being used at the time, that's off. And we thought, hey, in life, it happens in the same way. For instance, in a time like this for a business, your showrooms are off and some of the people you can't use are on off you have them you made the investment in the showrooms and retail and different and offices but they're off you're not using them for different reasons other lights are different colors for instance blue means on it means that we activate an auxiliary system maybe that we need for a while. For instance, the uh, very easy example is a defrosting in the winter. The plane has its own defrosting device and you use it in order to uh, 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 survive and to uh, get the plane working well. And that uses more resources and we do that in business in the same way. For instance, again, in times of this, there are extra resources that companies are spending on cleaning, on extra staff, on shipping, on things like that. Um, for somebody who is working in a company, it could be overtime. You can do this for a while, but it's unsustainable to have the blue button on all the time. Um, another light is the amber light, the light orange, which means caution. It means one of the systems of the airplane has a malfunction somewhere. It's not, it doesn't mean you can't fly, you can, but you need to be careful. In our life, this could mean a toothache or a headache, for instance. You don't stop working, but you 
need to be attentive and do something about it rather sooner than later. For a business, a caution can be maybe that the payment terms of your customers are growing uh, longer and longer and it takes more and more time for you to uh, see your money. Uh, and there's the, uh, the light nobody wants to see, the warning light, the red light, which means that the engine is on fire, there's a system failure, and you need to stop and deal with that immediately. For a business, it could mean, in a situation like this, revenues are down, business or supply chain is down, cash, we're out of cash or things like that. And we found this to be a very good parallel between aviation and between real life for us as humans, but also for us as businesses. And uh, the term is, how was your flight? Oh, it was dark cockpit all the way. How was your business last year? Oh, it was dark cockpit. All the, all the year. Um, I think we can, we can agree that uh, for a month or so, none of us have been in a dark cockpit. Um, we coined the term in the book, we, we say the opposite, what is the opposite of dark cockpit? We call it Christmas cockpit, with lights going on and off all the time and uh, with your attention needed in five or 10 different places in the same time. So this is an overview of the book. Um, and I'm glad to have the chance to meet with you guys and I'll give the, I'll pass the, um, the mic to Emil and he'll share with you a few interesting things and hopefully this will provide ideas to you. But please, if you have any questions, please use the Zoom uh, chat function uh, and write them there so we can see and we can start answering them. We don't really plan to talk for the entire hour. We plan to talk maybe, maybe 10, 15, 20 minutes, we'll see. But uh, the, the more questions you ask, the better and the more dynamic this call will be. So uh, this is uh, now for me and I'll pass the mic to Emil. Hello everyone, nice to see you here. Normally I'm uh, starting a conversation or a relation with you. You'll hear my voice on the speakers, on the cabin speakers. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, welcome on board. So welcome on our, on our conference, video conference. I'm glad to be here. Um, thank you, Octavian, for the nice uh, intro. Um, these days, uh, there's no dark cockpit anymore. Not in my aircraft, not in, I don't know, maybe in some business. But in, uh, in aviation, uh, everything is down. So for the moment, it's a Christmas cockpit. So it's very hard to manage. You have all the lights on. So it's very hard to check if uh, uh, the things are going as you plan. So yesterday I had a flight. So I went to, to Charles de Gaulle for a humanitarian flight. Um, generally speaking, I have three functions in my, in my company. One of the most important is as a pilot. So I'm a captain. As a captain, I'm, uh, my contract with the company is very, very simple. I have to bring an aircraft, it's a machine of maybe 100, 200, 300 million euros machine. I have to take it from point A to B with passengers and uh, luggage and uh, mail and cargo from A to B safely, in a safely, uh, timely and comfortable manner. So yesterday I had a flight to humanitarian flight to Charles de Gaulle Airport in France as a pilot. For me, my cockpit, the the real cockpit was in dark cockpit. We were three in it, but we were dressed in uh, overalls. We had goggles. We had uh, masks. So communication was difficult. Let's call it the dark cockpit. But then when we returned, we had to take uh, about forty prisoners. We have uh, half of the aircraft was full of police. We had uh, some humanitarian, um, uh, half of the aircraft uh, passengers with uh, some disease. We even had a six years old boy who was unattended. He, he came with us home to Romania. It took two hours and 40 minutes to, to uh, bring the passengers on board because everyone has to be checked. We, lo we lost uh, our slot for departure. Everybody got nervous except for the pilots because we had to fly the aircraft back home. So um, this is a kind of a activity when you have to take not just what you're paid to do, but you had lots of things to check, lots of things to manage. You have to uh, keep the um, communication with your cabin personnel, the, the flight attendants. I had to keep uh, contact with the police on board because we had to check the passengers in, uh, for two screens. We had to screen them for health and we had doctors on board, but also for behavioral, uh, well, let's say, screening, because there were some dangerous guys between those 40 prisoners. 
So this was my uh, pilot. Uh, this is my pilot part of the job. The other part of the job, the second one, I'm a TRI, so I'm, I'm a type rating uh, instructor. And in this, uh, in this uh, side of my job, I have to train people to become, uh, I train uh, young uh, people, uh, professional pilots to become um, professional on, uh, on a type rated aircraft, like a, uh, I'm flying Airbuses. So I type rate, uh, I'm since uh, nine, no, 2001, I'm an instructor and I train lots of people, all, all ages. The TRI is type rating instructor. And this, uh, this activity, uh, it's uh, half done in uh, ground school and half in a fly, full fly simulator, which is a cockpit of aircraft with uh, six uh, struts, um, uh, electro pneumatic struts, and inside it of it, it's a cockpit and all the sounds, it's a replica, it's a 100% replica of a cockpit. Inside of it, the pilots, they will have all the feelings, they will hear, they will see, they will feel exactly like an aircraft. Behind them, there's an instructor, and uh, from the instructor operating seat, the, um, using uh, the features that are presented in the simulator for instructor, you can um, induce defects to the aircraft, you, have, uh, you can induce the forces, they, the, the pilots will feel exactly taking off, landing, if they're laying smooth, it's a nice smooth landing, if uh, it's a hard landing, they will feel a hard landing, uh, the rain, the snow, fire on the engine, smoke in the cockpit, all kinds of um, malfunctions, you have to train them in uh, simulator sessions, which are uh, four hours each ses session for 13 sessions. This is my job as an uh, instructor in the simulator, and then I have to train those people in the aircraft. Some of the training is done uh, without passengers, and the rest is line training under supervision, and there's an instructor in the seat, and the, the trainee, it's a captain or a co-pilot, is in the other seat operating the aircraft under the supervision of the instructor. The last uh, side of my job, I'm a TRE now, which is type rating examiner. So um, on behalf of Romanian Civil Aviation Authority, I uh, have to check pilots if they uh, reach um, a level of proficiency, if they are able to fly an aircraft. So I check them uh, for knowledge, I check them for skill, for attitude, and uh, I have to sign, and the Romanian Aviation Authority will, um, and nowadays, because we are in the European Union, I um, endorse my uh, TRE license, and I also sign for different uh, pilots from different uh, countries in the um, UAE. Um, this is the, um, the most uh, boring part because I have to check them. I, um, I facilitate the communication, but I have to check them if they are at the proper level. And uh, I have lots of books uh, telling me how to do it. But the last, uh, the last question I had uh, always in my mind is if I'm, uh, I trust if those people are able to fly my family, from point A to point B as a pilot, I will assign for them to have a license as a professional pilot. Now, one of my, the most important and one of the most um, complex malfunction we encounter in the aircraft, it's uh, uh, an hydraulic malfunction. What's a hydraulic uh, system? The aircraft has uh, several, quite, quite a few actually um, systems like electrical, power plant, uh, uh, flight controls, uh, nomadic, um, but the most important, in my opinion, is the hydraulic. It's so important that the constructor of the aircraft, they put three uh, systems in the aircraft. So we have three hydraulic systems which are, they operate in the, independent from each other. They are not close to each other. So in case of an explosion or a rupture in the fuselage, they will not be affected, all of, all of them. Uh, they're like the muscles of the body. You know, from, from hydro, without hydraulic, this uh, piece of metal, with this uh, tube of metal with wings, instead of flying across the sky, will drop like a rock. So it's so important that um, they put three. We are um, sometimes when, uh, in a normal flight, when one of the system, one of the systems, one of the circuits uh, malfunction, 
it's uh, an amber light is um, it's a caution as Octavian said before and uh, there's not uh, re doesn't require the immediate uh, action of the pilot but it's a like a uh, thing to, to keep in mind because it will affect the landing distance it will affect the V approach or the final approach speed it will affect the aircraft configuration so all from the sudden with, without one of the three which are redundant to each other you have to choose carefully a, a suitable airport to land. Maybe it's the destination airport, maybe you have to go to an alternate. So all from the sudden, the pilots are in uh, not the dark cockpit anymore. The cockpit is dark, but when they look up on the overhead panel, they will see an amber light. Immediately they will uh, identify the malfunction. Now, I never, never read or never heard about two of the systems to malfunction to get all, all together. But on each simulator session, we have a dual hydraulic uh, uh, malfunction. And uh, based on that, because of that tree, um, all from now, we have, it's a more complicated situation. We have a land uh, ASAP in red, which uh, uh, the pilots they will have to call Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. Maybe it's a it's a call for emergency situation when the uh, life it's a uh, it's a life at the stake. Uh, when you call it, uh, the traffic control will alert the ground uh, services, all the ambulances in the that area, all the search and rescue services are alerted. So it's a it's a great uh, responsibility, and it, it goes to the captain to call Mayday. Um, in this situation, in the simulator, it's so complex, it's so, so many things you have to, uh, to do before landing that uh, it takes about 40 to 45 minutes to finish it. So we call it Mayday. The controller, we said, one of my friends, which is a controller, asked me once, he said, we, we had a Mayday and these pilots, they, instead of coming immediately to land, they, he said, uh, they stayed for about 40 minutes. And I, I said, yeah. It was a mayday and the land as soon as possible. It wasn't a crash as soon as possible, you know? So you have to prepare because you have only the, the, you don't have the responsibility. Your job as a manager, as a captain, doesn't end when you finish the landing and you go home. This piece of, uh, of uh, fine uh, um, uh, aviation industry with this aircraft, which costs, I, I told you, hundreds of millions of euros, has to fly tomorrow because you have a business. You have to, you need it to, uh, for other flights. You are in a system. All the colleagues will will uh, suffer if one of the aircraft crashes or um, you know stay grounded for a while. So for this situation, the hydraulic, um, the most unexperienced pilot at the beginning of their career, they will say, "Okay, let's let's go." It's written on the aircraft. Land SAP. Let's go to land. And I said, "No, no, no." First of all, you need, um, and they hyperventilated that because the aircraft uh, all of a sudden, it, the flight controls doesn't work as previously. Uh, every time you turn, there will be a pitch up or pitch down effect. So it's sluggish, the aircraft, it's difficult to control. So everybody's so, uh, it's so um, stressed and uh, the, the pressure on them, it's high because and as in, even if I'm instructor, even if I'm an examiner, I see the pressure for those pilots because they want to perform well. Uh, normally we let this exercise for the last part of the session, of the simulated session, because after a while they will, they will feel stress and it's not, it's not a good idea to continue after dual hydraulic uh, to continue with other exercises, you know? So, uh, all the time when I'm training them, I said, okay, it's a complex case. It's very difficult to handle the aircraft. It's uh, um, uh, never happened in the real life. But if it happened, what do you do? They know what to do because the, I hear a lot of saying, which are funny, you know, the, you need the proper mindset. Yeah, good. But you have to know all to, what to do all uh, at the same time, isn't it? It's not just the, uh, I like these sayings all the time I hear now, nowadays because I'm staying home a lot, and they're reading a lot. I'm, I'm hearing a lot of saying which are funny, but that they don't work anymore, you know? But the, talking about the proper mindset, the mindset for a complex uh, case like this is to, to see what is, what is working. So first of all, you have two good engines. So you have traction and you have uh, lift. The aircraft is flying, isn't it? Good. 
first of all. Secondly, the human resources, you have two pilots, isn't it? You can share between the task or the, uh, you have a task sharing, uh, each one has an area of responsibility. So we are not alone and you're trained, you're professional pilots. So what we have, it's a good aircraft which has two engines. You have electricity, you have pressurization, so nobody dies of um, hypoxia, okay? Yes, you can handle it harder, but if you press the, con the controls, you, you, the aircraft descends, yes. If you turn it to respond to your commands, yes. It's a sluggish uh, response, but it, it can control it, isn't it? Now, you can fly it, you can live in it, let's prepare for landing, okay? So we take it step by step because you have to, so we have to take a short-term decision, first of all, when the, the, um, the crisis um, strikes you, because you have to fly it first, okay? Let's fly, let's not drop from the sky. Secondly, you have to, uh, to navigate your, your aircraft somewhere. You have to make a, a long-term decision. Okay, now I'm flying, I'm not crashing. Uh, where I'm going? What, what uh, uh, destination should I choose? I have to do some calculation. How many, how many um, passengers? Where am I? If I'm going to a destination where I have no uh, commercial representative, I, have, I, have, I, will have, I will pay a lot for the passengers to reroute them because this is the, the ticket I'm selling. I'm selling a ticket for a passenger to bring it from, to fly it from A to B. If I'm landing at C, it's my respons responsibility to put the passenger on other aircraft, which sometimes on other companies, uh, which is not in alliance with us, so I pay a lot. I have to put them in the hotel maybe. I have to pay them uh, a meal. So all this, it's a, it's a commercial pressure also on the, the captain's shoulders. So all this to make the decision. And uh, in aviation, we never say, I made the decision, or I, uh, now I came with this. We call it, we built the decision. So I am taking the, all the information I have. First of all, let's solve the mechanically the, what, uh, the, the, the case, the crisis. And then I have to take all the information I need from the air traffic controllers, I have to take all the information I need from the other pilot, from the flight attendants, the crew. Uh, in my job, what, what I like in my job is that when we close the door of my aircraft, I know for sure we all were a team. We are really a team because nobody's in plus there, nobody's in, in minus. It, it, everyone counts, counts. Even the, the last, maybe the unexperienced uh, for, first officer or maybe the last flight attendant in the rear of the aircraft. And um, um, I have to t you have to take information from everyone in order to build your decisions. Sometimes the captain does nothing. You can see it there, the aircraft is flown by the first officer because there's no autopilot, there's no automation of the, of the, of the trust of the engines, and the captain does nothing. He just puts his uh, chairs, be, um, he pulled his chairs, uh, to have a better overview and builds his decision. Of the unexperienced captains or managers, they will try to do everything by themselves, okay? Because they are the, they are the best, and that's why they are the managers, they are the best. Uh, in my case, they have four stripes, so I'm the captain, but I'm not an orchestra man, okay? Sometimes it's better to, to let the aircraft be flown by a co-pilot or use the automation if you have it, in order to let me think better. Sometimes, if you are chilling down the cockpit, sometimes the best decision comes from your co-pilot. In my job, we encourage this. We grow up our, uh, we encourage uh, our um, first officers to talk, to come out with their opinions. Of course, they are more, less experienced than the captains, but sometimes they, maybe they have a better idea and you take it. And you said, okay, perfect. This is a good idea and we'll proceed accordingly to your uh, input. So it, uh, to return to my hydraulic case, uh, so it's not a crash or sap, it's a land or sap. You need time to prepare to land, you need time to, to see uh, what you have, not what you don't have, and to prepare the aircraft for landing and uh, in such a way not to break a, a landing gear, not to overshoot the runway or to crash. Okay, Octavi, Octavian. 
let me just uh, emphasize, and Emil, if you see the chat, there is one question there. Um, let me just emphasize, guys, that um, <clears throat> we chose this example because we thought, hey, what is this coronavirus? Maybe in some ways it looks like a, a hydraulic system failure. So many things are not going the way they should be going. And the temptation is to do all kinds of different things. But still, what are the best captains doing? They rely on what they have, whether it's the engine, whether it's the co-pilot and the crew or someone else in the team. And this, is, this must be something that we should be doing as well. And um, um, if I may just comment on the land ASAP versus crash ASAP, we see some companies um, because they have no revenues or very little revenues now, they um, uh, make so drastic cuts of uh, costs that it doesn't look like a land ASAP, which will be able to continue the business, but it looks in many ways like a crash ASAP, meaning, yes, we will bring the cost down to revenues, but how will that make us <clears throat> be able to fly again in the autumn or in one year or in the next years to come? So uh, there are many situations just like the failure of the hydraulic systems that um, we can learn from as people who are not flying actually an airplane, but we're flying a business, we're flying a family, a team, or even our own uh, self-life. Yeah. I mean, would you like to answer the question? We have, um, yeah. we have a question from Adrian. Thank you for the, uh, for the question. It's, um, it's a very, that very tough times for aviation now. Even though some parts of aviation, like general aviation or business aviation, growth four times these this, uh, two months. Um, but the rest of it, uh, it's uh, down. The cargo, the, uh, the cargo flights, they drop like 25 to 27%. Even though in this uh, field, there's a growth in uh, pharmaceutical uh, cargo flights from India and China, all over the world. But the rest uh, is down by 80%, 85%. Um, the best, uh, I read today um, some declaration of the BA, British Airways uh, CEO. They said that uh, they need maybe one year or two to recover. And also this, uh, the Lufthansa CEO said the same. So these days I don't think uh, if the states they will, they will not help the companies to cope. The, the workforce, the pilots, um, technicians, flight attendants, they're highly skilled. So if you lose this skill of a pilot, you cannot start it in 30 days. If a pilot doesn't fly for 20, uh, 30 days, in the 31st day, he had to fly with an instructor for a line check to, to see if his skill or her skill is at the, what uh, is required, a, a standard, a marginal standard at least. So um, imagine grounding um, hundreds, thousands of pilots, and then you, if you want to restart the industry, it's impossible to restart it like this, because it's impossible to put two unexperienced guys next to each other in a cockpit. Not even when the weather is good. What if there's a bad weather outside? What if they have uh, some malfunctions in the cockpit? how they will cope. So it's very difficult. It's difficult because if you lose this workforce, it's very hard to, to put it back uh, in the cockpit. To have a good captain on a jet uh, aircraft takes for, for a company at least five years, five years to have a young, young captain on the, on, in the cockpit, if not more, okay? So in my company, it takes maybe eight years to have a good captain in the, in the seat. To have an instructor, you need 10 years of flying of, as a good, good captain to be an instructor. So imagine if you lose this workforce, uh, the industry will not recover very soon, I'm, I'm, I guess. Uh, Emil, while you please uh, read the uh, upcoming questions, let me, let me add a comment and an invitation for people. Emil said earlier that the general aviation is up four times. General aviation means small private planes, so not the uh, 70 million private jets, but the four-seaters, the six-seaters, for which you need a PPL, a private pilot license, they are up four times, uh, April 2020 versus April 2019. So if some of, if some of you were passionate about flying, and you were waiting for an impulse from outside to get and do it, uh, now is the time. 
because you'll be able to have the freedom to, to move from A to B with your families or colleagues, um, most likely uh, in an easier way from now on. I read the question about the air uh, ground to air missiles coming to aircraft. You have nothing, you, you cannot do nothing. The aircraft uh, flies with maybe uh, 0 0.81, 0 0.84 Mach, and the missiles fly at least two times that speed. And uh, it's impossible to, to avoid it. So, but the good news is that uh, most of the, the ground to air missiles, they don't reach 12,000 uh, 12, meters, so they don't reach 39,000 feet. Okay? The, aircraft, the, the level aircraft flies normally. Super. Emil has is here. Uh, how do you see in terms of uh, strategy the whole industry? For example, we see that some, um, you know, kind of upstarts like Booking is going about to, you know, acquire a uh, kind of uh, an aviation company in Saudi Arabia based also because in the, of the fact of the oil is too, too low. So there are some opportunities popping up. And from my perspective as a, you know, kind of strategy guy, I see that they will be playing some MNAs. What do you see in Europe? How, I mean, this will affect the morale of the existing uh, people that they work in the industry? If you can elaborate a bit, I would really appreciate it. First of all, it's very difficult to maintain a, um, uh, an airliner. The activity is very, uh, a few years ago, when they had a good year, even though the aviation industry, they contribute with uh, uh, about 10 to 15% to the GDP worldwide, uh, the margin of uh, profit is 1.2, 1.3. And there were times because of the price of the uh, oil or because of the price of uh, uh, insurance maybe, uh, when they had, there was no profit for years. And something like this comes, comes on and I told you that the aircraft is very expensive and mostly around it, uh, the aircraft is, the aircraft is, is very expensive. The crew to maintain and pay is very expensive to and train. The maintenance is expensive because you have to do it uh, every day, every month or uh, major checks, which costs hugely, uh, huge amount of money. The insurance is high. So this cost uh, around an aircraft makes, makes it, um, you know, with a very, very uh, little profit, margin of profit. And uh, yeah, you can see opportunity in this, but nowadays uh, you, have, you can buy aircraft because they are, they are not on, uh, on the uh, waiting list anymore, like before. If you want to buy an Airbus now, you can buy an Airbus. If you want to buy a Boeing, they are on the tarmac waiting for you to buy, to, to, to buy it. And, but I don't see uh, a, a recover soon. Because uh, um, uh, there are different stages in, a, in, a, in, in over the year, and we lost one of the most important one. Now, I don't see the the holiday industry to recover soon, and which is a po important part of the of the transport the air transport. Yeah. Another thing, and I couldn't agree more with you, uh, is exactly as you said, I have uh, been interviewed in the past by McKinsey in one of the cases was in, in airline industry. And, you know, by crunching the numbers, we realized that if you are a European airline industry, you need to have 60 percent capacity in order one flight to be profitable. Having said that, uh, and according to social distancing measures that is applied to every industry, uh, how do you see a bit of, you know, kind of future thought? If we wake up after five years, uh, are going to be, you know, airplanes like with uh, social, I mean, to, uh, that count two people per S and, uh, you know, it, I mean, do you have some ideas how a future airplane would look like or do you believe that uh, it will not be or it can be productive from uh, big um, players like Airbus and so forth? Or do you see just as it is a bit of recovery, three, five years and then nothing, nothing innovation, no digital transformation, no product uh, development of the existing uh, aircrafts? How do you see the, the industry evolving? First of all, I think that this coronavirus uh, virus, uh, crisis will end soon. 
Otherwise, if you start uh, thinking that it will stay with us for years, nobody can tell you how the future will look like. But uh, my, my, I'm an optimistic. And I feel this, this summer will get rid of this uh, uh, virus uh, thing. So they will, we can start flying again. Because if you fly an aircraft with a social distancing, yesterday when I told you I flew to, to a humanitarian flight, and we were all dressed in overalls with goggles, which you know, they become wet. It uh, makes you not see well. And we have masks. And the passengers, we gave them masks and gloves. And then when they get out, they get in the, in the bus and there was no social distancing between them. They were like, like uh, close to each other. So we cannot control this social uh, distancing thing in an aircraft, to be honest. <clears throat> Octavian Emil, uh, hi, nice to see you here online. Uh, I have one question, um, which is very important from one perspective. Uh, during this problem, the measure that uh, both uh, you and Octavian mentioned before, uh, that the companies are taking, you know, it's very important how the people uh, are reacting, meaning the employee and the teams. Now, all of us know already that the pilot syndicate is something very strong and powerful, and if they want to, to mess our world, they can do it easily. Uh, I'm very curious to see how they are looking at this situation and how uh, cooperative are they and how how deep is their understanding and their support for the future recovery of this industry from business perspective especially and and the future of course for the moment uh, in my company in my flight in my fleet uh, we are only 11 percent of the pilots flying the rest of them they went home with 90 percent off their salary or the, the income they had in March like. So uh, uh, there are tough times and I'm also in the union, or a pilot union, and I see them, uh, they, they look for the future, you know, because if you do now, what, what can you do now? To put pressure on who? They understand the situation and we all hope for the, the next month to, uh, to be better. So. Now, if I uh, I put I, if I do some union uh, action now, I will put, just put more weight on the shoulder of the company shoulder. It will not solve a thing. And I I, I, I read because we are now uh, associated with some uh, um, trade unions from outside, from UE, from uh, United States, and they all they all agree. On that, no, uh, no uh, union actions for the moment. Everybody is waiting to see what will go on, what is going on. Maybe a good way to look at the situation is to look ahead, and also um, responding to Jarez's question earlier, is to look ahead and look at two periods. The first period is the one that we are in, which lasts until either the virus naturally slows down, or there is a, a medicine that you can take, or a vaccine. Until then, it's probably very fuzzy and very turbulent, and it's what we're feeling now. And then the second period is what happens after all. When we can say, oh yeah, the coronavirus, if you had it, take this, go to medicine, you have a treatment for that. And this period is very turbulent, and this period um, does not look good in any way for the travel industry. And even when the second period starts, this first period will have some consequences on the second period because now you cannot fly, you want to fly, but you cannot. But maybe um, uh, in the spring of 2021, um, you won't have the money to do it. The flying will be there because you don't have a job or people in large masses will not have a job and will not afford to fly halfway around the world or to a different to 2000 kilometers away for a holiday, but they will still have to stay home because their budgets are down. Or maybe because some of the largest companies which occupy many of the airplane seats throughout the world, they'll say, hey, we did it so well in these virtual things, whether it was Zoom and WebEx and so on. Why don't we keep doing that? And only instead of flying five times a month, let's just fly uh, once a year for that big particular summit. So uh, overall, the aviation uh, industry is, is, has a big question mark uh, on it, which makes it uh, very disappointing because um, up until last year, 
if you looked at the order books of both Boeing, even with the problems with the 737 MAX and also to Airbus, the airline looked uh, completely different. There was no, and we were discussing with Emil that there are not enough pilots in the world to be able to fly the planes that were ordered and paid for at, or uh, hard signed for in the coming years. So it's interesting how that industry shifted in just six months. And the question, of course, we're curious about the industry. We love to fly, we love to be in places and everything, but we, we should be even more uh, careful when we look at to see about our own businesses, what will happen to our own businesses, to our own staff, to our own union, whatever teams we have in ourselves and think about what will happen from now on for that. Any other questions, my friends? And if I can... Please, please, please go ahead. Can I ask something? Many of you had the kind of uh, incidents like uh, with Ryanair, especially with low barriers, uh, kind of uh, low cost firms, uh, that you know, ca kind of customer obsession is not on their core business. So we have the big companies and we have this kind of low firms that they don't care about you. Uh, how the customer obsession in terms of mindset is going to play out after this crisis? I am very curious to learn, you know, your buying on this. Would you like to go first, Emil, or shall I? No, please. Okay. Yeah. So there's um, in the in, and you're correct in observing that in the past years these low cost companies, uh, and let me just speak for a few moments about them because Emil wouldn't. He's so polite and he's so and his his integrity level is so high. He he would not do it. There were there were so many corners cut in the operation of these airlines, keeping safety and keeping everything, but not providing one penny extra that is just is just amazing let me just give you an example again emil will not give this example because it's um, uh, too okay to do that but for instance there's there's something that is known as the daily check of an airplane the daily check now the daily check of an airplane needs to be done daily because that's the name daily comes from and but the book because the people are wise and the people are experienced. The book says, if for some reason you cannot do it daily, then as an exception, you can do it every 36 hours. So you land the plane in Siberia somewhere, you, there's no crew, it's 3 a.m. in the morning and nobody okay, can do it. Daily. Some of the um, um, low cost airlines, as a practice, they're not doing the daily check daily, but they're doing the daily check every 36 hours. And that's the rule. And the exception is that they do it daily. So they've pushed all the rules and regulations to the max. And also the, uh, the incident um, a few years ago with the German wings when the pilot uh, went out to the restroom and the co-pilot stayed in and he took the pilot. If you, if you probably remember the incident. Uh, that was again because many, many corners were cut. So from, um, um, from, a, from a certain point of view, as a passenger, we cannot be happy that this coronavirus is, is, is happening. But we can hope that as things move on, they will again um, begin to care for what matters most, and that is safety and is the happiness and the uh, um, joy and the, um, 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 what is the name, the, uh, not the happy, yeah, the happy, let's call it the happiness of the customer. Customer satisfaction, yeah. Yeah, customer satisfaction, yes, I, I couldn't find the word. So we can now, we can hope, but what we can see now is that their priority now and in the coming months, the priority is to make some kind of money with cargo. You see many planes uh, um, doing routes with cargo, passenger planes. They were converted planes, uh, seats taken out and converted to cargo planes. Their focus now is to make some money, but hopefully in the second period that I, that I mentioned earlier, when you will be able to fly legally and social distancing and the medicine is your pocket so everything is fine will you want to fly or will you say oh let me just take my car to greece and let me go let me drive from bucharest to vienna again or maybe even to italy rather than fly then uh, the attracting customers will probably become again important for airlines and they will focus on providing the value that we were used to years ago and that in some of the companies we lost in the recent years let me uh, about your question, um, uh, the no frills companies, they are run by some very smart uh, entrepreneur, okay? So they will try to cut the costs on each item they can, 
it's not uh, something to to judge or to punish, isn't it? But uh, if the, if you let them uh, be, their imagination will go up to uh, what uh, the CEO of Ryanair proposed a few years ago, and he tried to convince the European Union and all the the states that it's feasible is that you can put more passengers in aircraft if they if they uh, just lean uh, standing up to a seat okay so you can put more passengers like this standing up leaning back on a seat not sitting down and he was uh, he was uh, uh, serious he was, he was not joking about it so this kind of uh, let's say imagination uh, um, has to be cut by um, regulators by the states because otherwise they will look for money and they will cut costs wherever they they, uh, they can on destroying um, let's say the joy of flight destroying the joy of being um, a pilot to the company because i'm telling you if you ask one of the pilots in one of the low cost carriers they will tell you the only thing they are there is the money it's not the joy of working there because they are a number okay so they uh, the only thing they enjoy is the money and they know they put big money on the pilot uh, uh, payroll okay and the system is very well done they buy mostly new aircraft because they are aircraft dealers they play the big two constructors against each other boeing and airbus and they say okay we'll buy uh, 50 i buy 100 aircraft in five years they they can sell it to a price to let's say to another company uh, with uh, huge amounts of money and they will run only or, or fly only with new aircraft which is one part of the deal but they are not quite uh, uh, airliners they are, uh, there's a business which uh, has a component of uh, uh, aircraft dealer it's a business which has a part of uh, uh, they're very agile and they they behave somehow in Romania because the legislation may, may be here and they permit, permit to, to be sometimes dishonest, the different uh, way uh, they act in Germany. No? Anyway, um, I think we'll remember that um, traveling was part of the journey when we were kids. It was war in the recent years. It was not that you really wanted, let's, let's get there and I'm sitting and I'm bumped and there's no, Anyway, for us, uh, I personally look forward to flying again. <laughs> I think that many of you do too. Uh, and uh, we will enjoy the experience of flight, uh, be afraid. Emil, there's a question there. Hi there, these days cargo rates rent sky high. Can a commercial airplane become a cargo airplane? Yeah, it can become, but because the costs are huge. There are hundreds of thousands of euros to convert your aircraft from uh, uh, passenger aircraft to a freighter. Uh, why? Because it, it's a matter of uh, balance, it's a matter of approval from the uh, state, matter of approval from the, the manufacturer of the aircraft, and then you have to use qualified men, uh, uh, highly skilled, the, everything is double checked, so it takes a while and costs a lot. Mm. Any other questions, friends? I have also another question. I know I know that uh, during our meetings we have a very nice uh, parallel between uh, what a leader in aviation, like Emil, is doing during a very, let's say, tight situation. Looking at what we are going through in this moment, is that parallel still uh, available? It's still available, but uh, thank you for the question. You know, there are lots and of please, and, please, and, and please detail a bit, because some of our colleagues perhaps don't know, and that will be very interesting, even though for the sake of a uh, gamification, just ask them, just ask a question, you know, during. As I told you at the beginning of my uh, uh, speech today, I told you about the simulator session we go, and uh, we train some of the malfunctions that never happen, and might never happen in the pilot's life but we still train them because we need the pilot to be prepared in that case. Some of those impossible malfunctions are considered more important, so we train them more often, okay? 
But uh, coming back to, to what you ask, there are lots of saying which now they look funny. Funny like haha, not like odd, yeah? Because it was a NASA, NASA astronaut and he said something like, a superior pilot uses his superior judgment uh, to avoid situations uh, which require the use of his or her superior skill, which doesn't work anymore because nobody trained us uh, to fly once a month and the flight not to be a normal one. Nobody trained us for COVID. I, 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 I was grounded for a month or so, and I thought a lot about it because I'm trained and I, uh, what I train in people, in the captain, I want to see this kind of judgment because I'm, uh, I try to, to make him uh, a leader all the time, not that just a boss in the aircraft. I want him to be followed by people and to him to be uh, um, open and uh, uh, to listen to, to what the people want to say in emergency situation especially. And uh, we, we didn't train for this, for this COVID, we didn't train. It's a, it's a situation, I went uh, a few days ago, I went to Munich and I saw a graveyard of aircraft. There were like hundreds of Lufthansa aircraft parked in, the, in, the, in a huge airport, Munich airport. Uh, in, a month ago, I was in, I was in, uh, in Heathrow. And you know how busy is Heathrow. You cannot land in Heathrow because your parking spot is not uh, free yet. So they count each minute in order to make the, the machine uh, work, the mechanism work. Now, some of the taxiways, which are four kilometers of them, parallel, lots of them, dozens of them, they're full of park aircraft. You, we were the only ones there, the two other aircraft. Yesterday in Paris, a graveyard of Air France aircraft. Nobody trained me for that. Yeah, I did my job as a pilot. I had to use my uh, uh, leadership because there were lots of things there. And uh, everybody in, in my aircraft, I had a medical team, I had some policemen, I had some air marshals. Each of them, they had their own goal, but I had to put them all together because sometimes there were uh, contradicting uh, things between them. So I had to manage that and my flight, which wasn't, wasn't a normal flight, by the way. I was dressed, uh, I, I had two pair of gloves, my touch screen worked very, very hard, I was sweating between that, my visibility was obscured. So it wasn't an easy flight for me, and I had to manage all, uh, all the things behind me. Nobody trained me for that. I have like 13,000 hours flight, uh, total flight uh, time experience, and I had more, more than 6,000 hours in the simulator, but nobody trained me for this. So in these times, a true, a real leader will find the resources to uh, rely, uh, rely spe especially on the, in my opinion, on the workforce, on the colleagues, and then not to crash, fly the aircraft, fly, navigate the aircraft. If you want to finish it tomorrow, yeah, you can land it uh, now and call it uh, finished. But if you, you plan to stay it, uh, in this business or on, on your business for, if you want to fly the next year or the next years, you have to, to use your uh, skills because every leader, every, every manager has developed this skill. He know sometimes he studies, sometimes he had uh, lots of hours, experience hours. Lots of uh, emergency situations between uh, uh, behind him, so he had uh, uh, this um, experience. But nobody trained you for this. Nobody trained to stay on the ground for uh, for a month and then to fly. Maybe this is the time where all that all those hours of experience are being fully used, because uh, if you didn't have those, you probably could not have. Uh, you probably would not have even been asked to fly that plane uh, yesterday. And maybe, because uh, I see where it's six o'clock, we're fine with time, but if we're coming to an end, I, maybe a quote is good here. It comes from Rudy Giuliani, whose um, personal branding is not at its best uh, uh, in these past years. But uh, when he was a mayor of New York City, people asked him, okay, how are you able to manage all that stuff? And he said, hey, we, we, never, we were never faced with 
things like this before a terrorist attack. But he said, we did have um, fires in skyscrapers before. We did have situations of power outage before. We did have situations of uh, major accidents and push for hospitals before. We did have planes come, small planes coming into the... It's just that these were all uh, together now. And uh, the quote I was thinking of is, prepare for anything you can anticipate and you will be prepared for what you cannot anticipate. And I think this is uh, just as valid for us today, both for Emil, but also for us in our businesses. Let's see what we can anticipate with not much, but let's see what we can anticipate and prepare for each scenario separately and for each item separately. We'll, we, we will be even better prepared for the things that we can not anticipate because uh, the, the future is uh, very hard to see these days. Any other questions or um, well, comments, we, guys? Yeah. We do have time and uh, if there are more questions, we'll, uh, we'll address them. I wanted to say something from the beginning. Check-in is open, but not <laughs> check-in in the flight, but check-in in our app. So uh, please do check in, uh, to the, in, the, in the app. I saw a question that also kind of Harris uh, mentioned it. Um, you guys are um, trained for contingency plans. It's not everything that is in the simulator that, you know, it's, it's going to be uh, something that you have to do. Uh, the simulator does, as, uh, as Tavi said, uh, train you for, for what you put in, in front of the pilots, but it also gets you used to this uncertainty. Because, yes, you train some, but you expect the worst. And this is something like that. So Roland put it a question uh, a little bit before uh, we, we jumped over because, as I said, Harris put it, how is going to be what you guys plan for the future now that maybe thinking of how to pick up back with the, with the passenger's flight, how, how you, you see that in uh, social distancing? You mean what is Tar what are companies like Tarom doing in these times right. to prepare all for them? Because now mm -hmm. uh, you know those uh, leaning lean back on the on the seats is not going to apply because it's not uh, you you cannot do that. So for so many reasons, and as we joked yesterday, I'm interested because of my height and my legroom. I didn't have legroom anymore. <laughs> so for you, standing up it will work. <laughs> on, on, on the on the on those uh, two levels you know the, yeah, on the double decker the airbus yeah, the H380, decker. yes so <laughs> on that for sure so um again i'm not think i i'm not sure this uh the aviation will, will survive this uh social distancing it doesn't end soon it's impossible to fly because look the break even if you run your company well if you have uh, trained pilots, which they, they, uh, they don't uh, uh, ruin the aircraft, okay? If you have uh, trained uh, flight attendants, if you have uh, skilled technicians, and you have a commercial uh, department which works nicely, a financial department will make good investments. Uh, the break-even point, the other day, it's between 60 and 70%. So you have to fill up the aircraft with 60, 70% if you have an aircraft of uh, 100 seater you need seven, 60 to 70 passengers to break even with the social distancing one third of the seater so all from the southern you have only 60 seats available they cannot cut from uh, pilot training it's costly it costs you a lot the flight simulator costs a lot and you have to do the training every six months you have to do a session of training. You have to do a session of uh, evaluation each six months for each pilot. On top of this, you have to transport the, passenger, the pilots to the simulator. If you have a simulator, a machine in your yard costs you millions. It's 10, 15 million euros as a full fly simulator. So you have to transport them. You have to give them accommodation per DMs and so forth. So all on top of each other, you say, okay, it's, it's too much. Uh, we have to cut costs from the pilot training. It's impossible. Because if one pilot, which is not trained per, uh, properly, 
crash one of the aircraft, your business going, goes down immediately. Because the customer, um, you know, they will not trust you anymore. If you have a bad, uh, bad uh, name in the industry, never, nobody will fly with you. So again, the technician side, if you say, okay, we don't need three, let's put two technicians. They would work hard. It's like in the cockpit, in the dark cockpit, you have the on button. You cannot sustain it for long. It's, the, the on button is like we work over time. You cannot work over, over time all the time. You will ruin your health. It will ruin your attention. At the end, your product will not, will not be good. So you'll not, you'll not be, uh, your product will not come out a good product if you stay over time all the time. If you have on buttons all the time in your cockpit. Uh, so it's impossible to cut corners in aviation because they will cost you. And I have lots of stories. Because in, in, as I said in the book, and we, uh, as we wrote it, in aviation, all the rules now, the rules we have now, they were written with uh, blood. Because in the beginning, the, the, the authorities were not so strong and everybody did what they want in parts of the, the world. Even now, the authorities are not very uh, strong and uh, you see uh, crashes all the time. There are some companies on the blacklist, they are not allowed to fly to Europe. And things like this, it, you cannot cut corners here. There, there, there are discussions about the, um, the states financing that one third of the planes, but um, uh, nothing is really decided because that's not uh, were very well feasible yesterday. One of IATA's newsletters yesterday talked, talked about cargo and was, it was a call for, air, for airliners to convert more to, for airways companies to convert more of their planes to cargo because um, um, capacity went down 22%, demand only went down 15%, so there needs to be composite. So there's still, it's still a lot of work in progress from, from many, many perspectives. But as I see in the, in the comments, Javier, for instance, we do not want any cut in pilot training in the same way we do not want cuts in doctor training or in lawyer training. Of course we don't. So it's hard to, it's hard to have everything. Uh, but we'll see, probably time will tell what will happen to, uh, to this industry and how many companies uh, will survive. And how, yeah, maybe um, they'll survive in different ways, but uh, we'll see how that will happen. Hello, Irina. Thank you for your question. And uh, thank you for raising a little bit of a, the, the, the more optimistic tone. Uh, I always uh, wanted to fly. Even now, when I'm sitting somewhere, if I hear noise, I can identify the aircraft I'm looking, I'm breaking my neck to see what aircraft is. So um, it was my, uh, my dream as a child to be, become a pilot. And um, well, for me, it's not a hobby, this, you know, it's not uh, something you do in your free time. Uh, as a professional pilot, I'm, uh, I'm very serious about it, but I'm enjoying it a lot. Um, I enjoy all of it. It's not an easy job because I have lots of things to do, but I like to solve complicated things and uh, as I like to read a complicated book. Okay. Uh, question. Um, you said before that um, um, if a pilot doesn't fly for 30 days, he will uh, lose some of his skills. Um, maybe it's uh, also similar to what we're experiencing now. So uh, we are in lockdown for over 30 days, 45 days, uh, and we business people, some of us uh, stay for a long time at home. Uh, our schedule is not the same. Um, my question is, uh, what do you, would you recommend us? I mean, you seem to come from an industry where is a lot, there's a lot of um, rigor and uh, protocol. Uh, how shall we keep ourselves uh, sane and uh, healthy during these uh, times? Um, as I told you, as an examiner, when I'm going to the simulator, I examine the people uh, under three uh, magnifier glasses. One of them is the knowledge. Okay? So as a professional, always there'll be a part of knowledge you have to, to, to perform well. 
It's not the knowledge uh, when you tell to some young people, this will be a job you have to, to, to learn all your life. They will jump over the window, isn't it? But we are uh, learning every day, actually. You don't have to read back all the uh, college year books, but you read. To, uh, so I, what I suggest, and what I suggested to my pilots now nowadays, because they are grounded, I told them, read all the time. Read the procedures. Read about the aircraft systems. Because when you go back in the, the aircraft, you'll be a little bit uh, uh, rusty. Okay, so you need to, to rely on the, your superior knowledge because if you don't read anything, you go in the cockpit, which is uh, a little bit unfamiliar with you. And if everything goes well and it's a dark cockpit, you're lucky. But what if uh, something goes wrong? And as always, when something goes wrong, there are, uh, things are connected to each other. So uh, when something bad happens, an incident or an accident in aviation, you can find lots of coincidences let's call it like this, you are tired, you are not prepared well, your knowledge level is low, your skill level is low. So let's, let's see the full part of the glass. What you have to go to do, read a lot about your job, read a lot about what other are, others are saying about their jobs, how they are coping these days and having so much time and internet, I don't see why not to read about it. The skill part, you cannot train. You cannot train uh, uh, other than flying in my, par in, my, um, in my job or other than going into a simulator, which is, I, I told you, reproduces 99% uh, uh, of what the pilot feels and seems uh, exactly like a real aircraft. Um, and the last part, which is most important, and for an examiner, this is the, uh, how I say, this is the, um, uh, the most important uh, thing is the attitude. Because uh, if you have, you have, you can train anybody to, you can, if you want to arise your uh, knowledge level, I give you more books and you can read. If I want to train you, I can train my uh, 15 year old son to land, my mother, she's 82, I can teach her in a simulator how to land. I will land with her 100 times and I'm telling you she will land. She will land. So it, the skill is, again, something you can train. What, can you, what you cannot train is the attitude. The proper attitude, how to communicate, it's very important. How to be assertive, because everybody's, I, I told you, uh, lots of sayings, like in a Facebook, you know, superior pilot, no, it doesn't work any, any, anymore. You know, uh, a proper mindset, okay, okay, what to do next? What's your plan exactly? What's your plan? What you want to do? A superior, no, it doesn't work anymore. So the attitude uh, is something which uh, doesn't, you cannot read about it. If you try to learn it from a book, it's impossible. It will come out of your experience, it will come out of your uh, knowledge of the aircraft, knowledge of how to uh, behave in a group, in a team, how to deal with the uh, uh, malfunctions, uh, how to put people together for an outcome. This is a, uh, so my advice is to read a lot and to try to be a, a assertive, open, communicate with people in your team, be honest. This is my advice. Before that, uh, I see there are no more questions. Um, Tavi and Emil, thank you. Thanks a lot for, uh, for your speech. It's, uh, it's great to, to take a left into into the cockpit uh for uh, again dark cockpit it's uh it's a it's a journey it's a journey to that uh cockpit uh, dream and to the processes and to all the stories thank you for the first hand story and uh, we really appreciate that uh friends we uh I, I wish you good days so uh, first of all emil and, uh, and octavian thank you guys thank you very much thank you thank you for your time it was a pleasure to be with you